so, God. Is it okay if we talk about God today? There's a lot of God in that ancient testimony, right? There's like dozens, dozens of gods. And I know we are a beautifully, theologically diverse congregation. I know we've got lots of personal and collective triggers that get tugged whenever we bring up that word, God, and that makes a whole lot of sense. But Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was a man of God. So we're going to talk about God today. And I want to talk about God today especially because this past Thursday, I was making my way downtown from Judson to 26 Federal Plaza, a familiar route by now. And I was walking down Broadway, sheepishly wearing my clergy collar so I could once again attempt to strike something like the fear of God into the hearts of some ICE agents. And I passed a man, a normal-looking man, cap, glasses. And this man made quick eye contact with me as he passed. And then when he was right next to my ear, he said at full volume, God is dead. <laughs> and then he just continued up Broadway. <laughs> as if nothing had happened. And I was shook by this news. Fearful that I might be out of a job. I spent the rest of my walk wishing I'd asked him what God he was referencing. But since I'll probably never see him again, and since I've got thoughtful people like you to talk to instead, I come to you today wanting to know what you think when you hear someone say, or when you yourself say, God is dead. Or heck, when you hear someone say, or you say, God is alive. Or for that matter, God is anything at all. This word God gets thrown around a whole lot by a whole lot of people lobbed back and forth until it kind of means everything and kind of means nothing all at the same time. This word God can be used to lovingly heal one moment and used to hatefully hurt the next moment. And in these current chaotic days of God being used to justify fundamentalist evangelical support for this country's most heinous systems, policies, actions, violence, white supremacy, racism, and rhetoric, I can understand why I sometimes say this word God in a sermon and I see knee-jerk little winces spread throughout the crowd. It's simultaneously a powerful word and a powerless word. And that's a combustible combination. In this society, God is simultaneously alive and well and dead as a doornail. And that is a frightening fact. So even if we can argue that the actual concept of God is beyond all human understanding and can't itself be co-opted for evil, that little three-letter word, God, still certainly continues to be co-opted for all kinds of evil. And as modern-day prophet Anne Lamott says, you can safely assume you've created God in your own image, when it turns out that God hates all the same people you do. And I don't know about you, but I'm not satisfied with my image of God simply reflecting my own politics, my own opinions, my own image, my own self-satisfied ideas of my, 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 my wokeness. It's 2020. We're heading for something major by the end of this year, no matter what. And I'm seeking something deeper than a God who simply wants the November election to go the way that I want it to. I want my God to be something bigger than the God of the folks who have made gods of their guns, of their borders, their nations, their race. But I often get stuck with a God that might not be as hateful but is oftentimes just as small. So thank God, or whatever, for Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. No matter how much we try to whitewash the words and legacy of Dr. King, the God he cites, the God he celebrates, the God to whom he devoted his entire life unto death, refuses 
to let us whitewash it, shrink it, or paint it in our own image. The God that Dr. King preached is a God that wants to bring comfort to the afflicted and affliction to the comfortable. One who digs into our hearts and exclaims, a lie cannot live, instead of lazily fitting into all the same things we believe. So this weekend, when we traditionally celebrate the fierce ministry of Dr. King, I've been turning over and over in my mind just what it means to simultaneously live in a country where we both celebrate a historical civil rights movement grounded in the decolonizing, anti-racist, anti-imperialist, anti-poverty, anti-war imperative of a loving God, and are still currently engulfed in a swirl of chaotic political discourse where the loudest voices now calling on God seem to be those who ground their movement in a colonizing, racist, greedy, hate-filled, fear-filled, white supremacist, violent God. It's a head trip to have come so far and to have not come very far at all, all at the same time. And it makes me understand more and more why I look out at so many of you on a Sunday morning and when I say the word God, I see that little tick start to quiver in the corner of your eye. Who is the God of which we speak in this place? When the God of whom those other folks speak, the God of whom those misguided but powerful evangelical fundamentalist folks outside speak, goes by the same name. Who is God to you? Who is God to Judson? How do we choose between the characteristics of God that we embrace and those that we reject? Are any of us ever talking about the same thing when we even dare to say the word God? In ancient times, early Christians had two main ways that they defined God. And the fancy words for those two approaches were cataphatic theology and apophatic theology. Anybody know these terms? Ooh, good. Here we go. Here's a little primer. Those Christians who subscribe to cataphatic theology or positive theology defined God by saying what God is positively. So they built their definition of God by saying things like God is beauty. God is love. God is truth. God is, what, do you, what would you say positively about God? God is what? God is Creation, it's a positive, cataphatic way of talking about God. Now, those Christians who subscribed to apophatic theology or negative theology thought that you could only define God by saying what God is not, negatively. So they built their definition of God by saying things like, God is not hate. God is not greed. God is not violence. God is not what? What would you say negatively about God? What? So God is not selfish. God is not white supremacist. God is not racism. But I think these days, when we progressive Christian-ish folks spend so much time on the defense desperately trying to clean up the mess left in the wake of fundamentalist evangelical Christianity, neither the cataphatic or the apophatic theologians have it completely right. We need something more than a simple, never-ending shouting match with both sides screaming, God is definitely this, or God is not this. I think we need a relational <laughs> theology and imago dei theology. And that's a fancy word. Anybody know what imago dei means? Image of God. Imago, image, dei, God. It's a fancy term to say that all people are made in the image of God. Have you ever heard the phrase, it's on tons of like magnets and towels in the Midwest, 
along with like things about dieting and like my diet will start tomorrow and things like that. I sometimes run across this phrase, you might be the only reflection of God some people encounter today. Think about what that fact demands of you. <laughs> Holy crap. Think about the glorious possibility to which that fact calls you. And think about what it means for all of us to have that call for one another. You might be the only reflection of God some people encounter today. And they might be the only reflection of God that you encounter today. Modern-day prophet Ram Das once said that no matter your religion or your spirituality or whatever, in the end, we're all just walking each other home. And Joy Harjo, in that poem that Nia read so beautifully, Joy calls it helping the next person find their way through the dark. Well, this is my very simple thesis today owing debt to Dr. King and Mr. Das and Ms. Harjo and Ms. Lamott, and it's this. What if we spent every day as if we were the only reflection of God some people would ever encounter? How would that change your behavior? And what if we treated every other person as if they were a reflection of God that had the power to change our own reflection of God? How would that change the way that we approached every single person we meet? Now, these intimate, interpersonal interactions are different from empire systems. Empire systems represent the worst that can happen when we stop reflecting God, stop looking for the reflection of God in others and build walls out of hate, fear, supremacy, and greed. But the dismantling of those empire systems, while absolutely needing collective organizing, also at their root need individuals interacting on an intimate level. And simply saying, I see you. Do you see me? Can we help each other find our way through the dark? I've seen the best of what can happen when we do this. And I've seen the worst of what can happen when we don't do this. And here's a glimpse of both. Something came as a surprise to me pretty early on in my days working here at Judson. And you, you might be surprised as well. There are people, and I don't want to sound too grand, but like there are thousands of people who are looking at and observing Judson from the outside, who don't make it here on a Sunday or any other day, who might never actually set foot in our sanctuary, who come across our website through a random Google search or find us on social media. And many of the folks who find us on a Google search and are watching us from the outside are incarcerated seeking some kind of connection behind prison walls, doing time for a variety of real and perceived offenses, but wanting to connect to a place like Judson, that little place that we often take for granted, that little church that is committed to making a big difference. I've answered letters from many of these folks, and I'm not talking email. I mean physical letters like that you put a stamp on. I bought Mr. Rogers stamps just so that I have some. And I've been amazed at how many of these letters boil down to the same thesis question. Does anyone want to guess what that recurring thesis question is? What do you think would be the most pressing question from many of these incarcerated folks, mostly men who write to Judson? Shout it. Is there redemption? Is there a reason? Am I going to be all right? Am I going to hell? Does God still love me? Does God exist? 
feel like all of those things are kind of inside this question. Oh, this, the real question is very specific. The main thesis question tends to be, if I'm gay, does God still love me? At a place like Judson, where we enjoy the privilege of being regularly affirmed as LGBTQ, et cetera, people, where we enjoy the privilege of not really even entertaining the question of whether or not God might have a problem with our queerness, this might seem like a ho-hum, been there, done that, trite question. But why do you think we get this question over and over again, specifically from incarcerated folks? We all know homophobia and transphobia still run rampant all over the place, and we get these questions from non-incarcerated folks as well. But why do you think we get this question specifically from incarcerated folks? If I'm gay, does God still love me? Why do you think that's on their mind? You're getting there. Because the majority of Christian chaplains in our prison system are fundamentalist evangelical chaplains. Think about that. The reason we get so many letters from LGBTQ, et cetera, incarcerated folks is because when they seek any kind of Christian guidance within the confines of those prison walls, the only Christian voices they have reflecting back to them are fundamentalist evangelical voices. And when you only have fundamentalist evangelical Christian voices reflecting back to you, God starts to sound a lot like those fundamentalist evangelical Christian voices, and then, before you know it, God hates your queerness and hates you just as much as those fundamentalist evangelical chaplains do. A couple of years ago, I got one of these letters from a man named Clifford who was serving time in an upstate prison. And the letter was long, and he said, Lots of things, including sharing the trumped-up charges that were the reason for his incarceration in the first place. But the main question for me was, if I'm gay, does God still love me? And I did what I always do. I got out a pen, had a unicorn at the top, and a piece of paper, and I wrote back what I truly believe, and that is that I truly believe that God loves him, especially because he's gay. And I invited him to visit if he were ever able. And then I sent the letter out into the world, hoping its reflection of God might change the reflection of God that had been poisoning Clifford's mind. I didn't think I'd ever meet Clifford. <laughs> but last month, while we were serving our weekly meal at Judson Arts Wednesdays, a man I'd never met before came up to our little kitchenette island, attractive kitchenette island there in the back, to get some soup. And I ladled it into his bowl. And he said, Pastor. And I said, Hi. And he said, I'm Clifford. And I smiled, desperately searching for the context. And then he said, the gay guy. <laughs> and it all came flooding back to me. And the light of God reflecting off of his face was ferociously bright. He said, I found you. And I said, you found us. <laughs> I'd like to believe that Clifford also found something like a loving God that night, but at least he found Judson that night. And I know that I found a piece of God that night. Later that night after the meal and the show, I went downstairs to close up the front door where Adrian sits during Judson Arts Wednesdays, and Clifford was outside, just in front of the main stairs, a boombox was playing across the street. The music was loud and bass-heavy, and Clifford was dancing. 
moves that I could never even attempt, waving his arms and legs so freely, free of the confines of mass incarceration, free of the bankrupt God reflected by those fundamentalist evangelical prison chaplains, probably still frightened as hell, but free for the moment, seeking walking partners, dancing partners, God partners. In the end, we're all just walking each other home. And if we really get into it, we might even dance each other home. The God who helps us through the darkness is not ours to hoard. It is not ours to use to harm. But while people are using it to harm, it is for us to loudly use to heal. The God who helps us through the darkness is for us to share until all are helped through the darkness, until all find their way home. In the words of Michelle, <laughs> until we all are free. God isn't dead, but as Dr. King preached, a lie doesn't live. Whether you think of a God as a big being in the sky or a web or a force, or if you rarely think about God at all, we really end up building God together. God really is just most typically our actions that we reflect out into the world and that we absorb from others. So don't make God in your own image. Don't make God that small. Look deeper and see the image of God that's waiting inside you. Look deeper and see the image of God that's waiting inside every person you encounter. Something difficult but beautiful happens in the dance between those two things. The dance between the God reflected inside you and the God reflected inside somebody else is not going to be easy. But you'll learn the moves. So here is our simple and daunting task. Repair the damage caused by the shrunken, poisonous gods. Reflect the possibility of the God who is bigger than we can imagine and dance each other home through the darkness. And speaking of dance, Austin, would you come and dance us home?